one hour there is a eight hours or nine hours time restricted eating uh, people are inadvertently reducing calorie intake sometimes by 20 percent for people who are feeling low energy uh, fatigued um, who are looking to lose weight and, and improve their body composition how can um, fasting or time restricted eating potentially help them yeah, so time restricting is actually based on the principles of circadian rhythms. Uh, so that means circadian rhythms are daily timetable of um, that are present in every cell, in every organ on our body, and also in brain. So that means we are pre-programmed to do certain things at a certain time, and if we be on time with our circadian clock, then our physical, emotional, and intellectual performance will reach at its peak level. And the reason is circadian rhythms actually fine tune our immune system so that we are resilient to infections and we can also recover much faster from infection. Um, the circadian rhythms also um, time every day that we, our liver can and our metabolism can detoxify many genobiotics that we eat that can affect multiple organ systems and also our brain because brain also has to detoxify itself. And then it also tunes our muscles and connective tissues in a way that every day um, we make a lot of injuries to our muscles and connective tissues. So it's, it's a constant cycle of injury and recovery and circadian rhythms kind of optimize that recovery process so that we are fit the next day. So similarly, they also, the circadian rhythms also uh, tune that every day all the intracellular damage that we make, for example, DNA gets damaged, there's mutations and they have to be repaired. The proteins are misfolded. So they are folded back properly so that our enzymes work properly. So that's why paying attention to circadian rhythm and being on time on certain uh, stuff that we are programmed to do hmm. uh, will actually improve our overall health because it have, it clocks are present in every cell, so it will improve our brain health, our gut health, our liver health, all this health. So now the question is, what are the things that we are supposed to do? <laughs> there are, when we think about circadian rhythms, there are there is one thing that pops to our brain because this is the thing that uh, strongly affects all of us and we relate that sleep-wake cycle. Every mm. day we are programmed to sleep at night and when we sleep, our brain is just not going and kind of sleeping and not doing anything because that's the time when repair, rejuvenation and resetting is happening in the brain. So similarly, if we think a little bit carefully, most people will realize that they can go overnight without feeling hungry. And during daytime, maybe towards the later in the day, people start to feel hungry. Hmm. So that means our circadian clock has also programmed us to eat within certain time during the daytime or during our wakeful time. So over the last 20 years, that's the biggest thing in circadian rhythm that we figured out that when we eat is actually programmed by the circadian clock and if we are on time with eating so then we can improve you can sustain nurture our circadian rhythm so that's how the concept of time restricted eating came uh, which means that um, we have to if we restrict all our calorie containing food and beverages to certain time consistent time during our wakeful hours of course then that can have an impact on um, circadian clock. It will nurture our circadian clock, and that will lead to overall health benefit. Even those who are not, who are already fit, and they want to just improve their health, then they can also improve that. And then the question is, how long should we eat? When should it be? And we can go into the detail. I love this. I mean, a lot of people talk about um, time restricted eating. Well, I guess before I ask the question that I was going to ask. What's the difference between time-restricted eating and intermittent fasting? Well, intermittent fasting is a very broad term because if you go back to the old literature on nutrition, um, suppose we take everything that we know about nutrition, it boils down to three things. The quality, quantity, and timing of food matters. And 
quality, mm. quantity, and timing. Yes. Um, and we can go in great length about quality and you have already talked to many of your podcast guests about quality of nutrition. It goes from fiber, protein, and what kind of carbohydrates, uh, fat, etc. And that matters. And then the quantity, when it comes to quantity, we also know that we should not overeat, first thing. And second, those who want to lose some weight or uh, even improve their health who are overweight or obese, then reducing calorie helps. And for a long time, people had done these, ex- scientists had done these experiments very carefully in laboratory animals where they reduce calorie intake to by 20% to 40% below what is required. Um, and that calorie restriction led to long lifespan in laboratory condition. So that led to the idea that, yeah, once in a while you should actually reduce calorie content. i uh, sorry, chronically you should reduce calorie. It's not easy to count calories and every day do that. So then people came up with alternate way to achieve similar approach. So that led to this idea that you can fast one day or two days in a week or even alternate day fasting or even you can fast for five or six days within a month or two months. So all of this led to the broad term that's called intermittent fasting because you are not fasting regularly, you're kind of fasting intermittently. And uh, when we published time-restricted feeding or time-restricted eating, uh, the initial experiments were actually done without reducing calories in mice because we wanted to see what is the impact of just changing timing but not changing the quality or quantity of food, what happens to mice and fruit flies. And in those cases, what we found was even mice that are fed a very high calorie diet, we call it obesogenic because this diet high fat and high sucrose diet make mice and also humans obese. Even when these mice were eating obesogenic diet within eight to nine hours, um, they didn't gain weight. Hmm. And in fact, if we take obese mice and put them on this same isocaloric diet within eight to nine hours, they lost weight. So that's how we describe time restricting, which at least in animal models does not involve reducing calorie on any given day. But somehow people thought that, okay, so <laughs> since we are going to, the animals and humans are fasting for or not eating for 14 hours to 16 hours, let's call it also intermittent fasting. Mm. And since this is the, this is something that most people can kind of relate and do that on a regular basis, it became very popular. And now intermittent fasting uh, typically refers to some form of time restricted eating. But if you go back to scientific literature, intermittent fasting typically refers to fasting for one or two days in a week, alternate day fasting or periodic fasting. But for all practical purpose in this modern <laughs> existing world, um, I think people refer to time restricted eating as intermittent fasting. Got it. So intermittent fasting is really sort of like the colloquial, non-specific way yeah. that people refer to myriad different yeah. um, food restriction uh, paradigms. Yeah. But time restricted eating is like the the specific form of it that you study in your lab. Yeah. And intermittent fasting also makes uh, kind of conveys the message that, yeah, once in a while you should fast. Mm. And it doesn't say whether it should be daily or whether your fasting should be consistent. So for example, um, you know, if I fa- if I eat only between say 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. today, and then tomorrow if I eat between four, 8 p.m. and 4 a.m., um, in for most people, they'll think that, yes, I'm doing intermittent fasting or time restricted eating, but it's actually not right because when we eat um, signals our circadian clock that, hey, this is the timing cue, digestion starts and all that stuff. And the clock also predicts next day, you're supposed to eat at the same time, so mm. it's ready. But if you're, not re- if you're not eating at that time, then you're kind of missing the benefit of the clock. So that's why what we said, time restricted eating is a form of eating uh, where you eat within a consistent window of time. Um, so if you're eating, say, between 8 and 4, 
try to be as consistent as possible means it's not that to the minute but <laughs> if it is within an hour or half an hour then that's pretty good the reason is um since it's linked to the concept of circadian rhythm you can kind of link to what happens when daylight saving time changes so we know it's only one hour change in time but it kind of throws us off for at least two or three days so because our brain is tuned to when we should be waking up when we should be going to bed and then when you abruptly change the timing by one hour then our brain is trying to catch up so that's why it's very easy to connect that right after the daylight saving time changes for at least one or two days we are not at our peak performance hmm. we feel groggy we feel kind of sleepy or uh, so just imagine if it affects your brain so much then changing your breakfast time particularly from one day to another uh, is also affecting our digestive system or metabolic organs but since we don't feel that <laughs> we don't connect it but actually it does affect us wow so it's just one hour really is all it takes yeah so it uh, the rule of thumb is you our clock takes one day to readjust to a one hour change in sleep time or time zone or eating time oh uh, interesting yeah so if you switch time zones and you like if i fly from here which is where we are is LA to New York and that's a 3 hour time difference. I could expect that it will take th- approximately 3 days yeah to adjust to that schedule to come back to your peak performance. Wow. I Means we we kind of try to drink a lot of coffee and think that we are at the peak performance where we can uh, function but actually uh you might have experienced that uh that after 3 or 4 days after you have good night of sleep <laughs> then you don't need that much caffeine and you feel more energetic and and that difference can be uh, for some people that doesn't matter much but for some people just imagine athletes or somebody who is going to going to be a, going to play in a chess championship wow. <laughs> for, the, for those people it's a big difference so in fact many athletes that try to fly way in advance to compete and uh, so that they can adjust to the new timing or even some athletes they know what time the competition will be so they try to practice at the same time same time if they're in the same time zone or kind of adapt their clock so this because for them even few milliseconds <laughs> makes or breaks a career so you're right yeah uh, so that's why to be at our peak performance we should be on time to <laughs> wow. without clock. Next time I get hired to speak uh at an event in Europe, I'm going to let them know that I need to fly in 8 <laughs> days earlier. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or you can time your talk to very early morning or late mm. night. <laughs> That's the least preferred option. Yeah. Um super super interesting. Okay. What when you were talking about the mice? Yeah. And the and the calories um them being on isocaloric diets yeah. and the mice that were um restricted to a certain feeding window didn't seem to gain weight is it how does that work because we know that calories right energy balance is yeah. is uh is pivotal when it comes to you know weight loss or gain yeah um as i said there is clock in every uh, organ so uh, starting from let's start from digestive tissue like our gut and the intestine and uh, there is a very strong rhythm in our gut which is also linked to our pancreas because pancreas makes all the enzymes to break down what we eat and to digest so that means there is a peak time when uh, our gut can digest food and our intestine can absorb those nutrient and there are also gut microbiome those are present uh, throughout our intestine and digestive tract um so what we have in subsequent studies when we look at look back at gut microbiome what we realized is the gut microbiome also changes with time restricted eating or feeding uh, i'll be using time restricted eating for humans feeding for <laughs> animals for obvious reason and um what happens in animals at least um that the fiber that's supposed to be digested high up in the intestine actually gets digested lower in the intestine and that's where when it's get digested 
the sugar uh, is not absorbed because some excess sugar uh, gets excreted in mouse poop because there are not enough that the mechanism to absorb that sugar from fiber or complex carbohydrate is present in the upper part of the intestine and it's not in the lower part and by the time it gets digested because of the change in gut microbiome it changes the second thing that also happens that's linked to the liver is um, time restricting changes how cholesterol is metabolized cholesterol gets broken down to bile acid and that bile gets into the intestine to absorb uh, fat and then get it back into the body but the gut microbiome changes in a way that it um, redecorates this bile acids and these bile acids cannot absorb cannot be reabsorbed that efficiently so these bile acids and some of the fat they get uh, the mice poop out that so in that way what we think is all of the mice are eating isocaloric diet the body is not absorbing all the nutrient that they are eating because of changes in gut microbiome liver and maybe pancreas and the second thing is when mice go through long 14 to 16 hours fasting and we also humans go through that fasting and in the first few hours of the fasting we use glycogen as the stored carbohydrate and then when we run a little bit low on carbohydrate then the fat tissues and also liver start to break down some of the fat and this fat breakdown is circadianly regulated and also depends on fasting so when mice fast for a long time and humans maybe because uh, we haven't done those very systematic study um what we see is mice can burn that extra fat so uh instead of storing them because it needs they need a long fasting to trigger the pathways or the mechanisms or the genes that burn fat so that happens and we also know that these mice have slightly high um oxygen consumption so that means we take oxygen to to oxidize our fuel and so that means they are actually burning more fuel so we see that signature in two places one the white adipose tissue or the bad fat um that improves its actually size or content decreases and then the brown adipose tissue or the good fat and humans also have some brown adipose tissue they get more mitochondria and they there is a signature that uh, gene expression signature or genetic genomic changes that happen that suggest that these mice actually lose a little bit extra heat Hmm. Uh, so literally born fat so at least these are some of the mechanisms that we know um are happening so that's why although they're eating isocaloric diet they're not storing that uh, they're not absorbing all of it first thing and second when they're storing during this long fasting they are also burning it off um so next day when they start eating they have already burnt some of the fat that they ate the previous day that is fascinating so it actually at least in mice see eating at 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 the at suboptimal times seems to make um fat and carbohydrate essentially less or i'm sorry more bioavailable yeah. than eating during the optimal time yeah so um Yeah so you can say bioavailable but actually uh, it's getting metabolized or getting oxidized and burnt off during the fasting time so they're eating at the same time so um, right after they start eating within 15 minutes or so the body's metabolism changes so that they, the body actually stops burning fat and starts storing fat storing mm. carbohydrate and that happens um, for most of the they oh sorry for mice mice eat at night time so as long as they're eating they're storing some fat and burning little bit of simple sugar and then storing also some sugar as carbohydrate uh, as uh, glycogen then after the fasting begins for the first few hours they're burning that glycogen and then slowly they'll start to metabolize the fat so yes bioavailability 
is slightly reduced because of the microbiome change. And then even what is observed and stored, that store is also depleted wow. <laughs> every night <laughs> or every day when the mice uh, go through fasting. Yeah. And so it, so it, it kind of, it's not at odds with like with energy balance. It's affecting the it's it's in a way affecting the calories in yeah. side of the equation. And also calories out. And of the also equation. calories out. Yeah. Fascinating. So, so we still have to see uh, what happens in humans because humans store more glycogen. So it takes a long time for humans to burn up that glycogen than mice do. Um, so I think in humans, if they eat isocaloric diet, like the regular uh, when they're not doing timeless eating, we have to see whether they will lose weight or they will maintain that weight or they will change the way their body composition is, whether they will convert some of the white adipose tissue to healthy adipose tissue. So all those experiments are yet to be done because these are, again, doing controlled human studies is very difficult. And there are very few places in the world where people can be brought into the lab and they can be fed uh, every day, the same isocaloric diet, uh, either within a short interval or a long interval. So we have to wait for those uh, experiments. <laughs> and those are probably very expensive experiments to do. It's very expensive to do. And also there are very few volunteers who are ready <laughs> to do that. <laughs> I can imagine. So what is then the, what the, the existing, of the existing human clinical data? Like what, what is the, what is the research tend to show? Yeah, so the first thing is uh, when people eat, because if everybody is eating within eight to 10 hours, then there is no benefit they'll get by changing timing. And um, so initially we made an app called My Circadian Clock app, which is still available for anyone to download. So it's a research app. Um, we asked 156 people who are not shift workers, because we know people who work day and night shift, they might have different eating schedules. Um, so we asked regular folks like you and I who have a day job or who are staying at home, homemakers, um, to log when they eat or drink something. They didn't have to say what it is, portion size, nothing. So we reduced the burden of logging and uh, they have to log it for two or three weeks because uh, this is very important because if I just look at my eating habit for one day, it might be very different from what I habitually do. Mm. So for example, I this morning I got, I woke up very early because I was jet lagged and then by seven I had my breakfast, 7.15. And uh, by the time I go drive back to San Diego, I don't know what will be, when will I have my last meal, but it may be eight or nine at night. But on other days, my schedule is very different when I'm not traveling. I try to eat between, say, 8 and 6 p.m., so it is 10 hours. So if somebody is taking a snap sort of me today, then I may come up as somebody who eats from 7 a.m. till 9 p.m. or 10 p.m., <laughs> And whereas um, my habitual eating time is very different. Mm. And also sometimes in the weekend it might be different. So that's why we collected data for three weeks. And what we found was, um, and then what we do, we take all these time points of when people ate or drank something that has calorie. When I say calorie, more than five kilocal. And then we asked, what is the likelihood that the body expects food um, on any given day? So we kind of take a statistic saying, okay, so what is the 95 percentile interval of this time window, then we find that nearly 50% of adults eat for 14 hours, 45 minutes or longer. Okay. So uh, here is some nuances. So for example, suppose say uh, I'm eating from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. one day, tomorrow I eat from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Day after tomorrow it's 7 a.m. to say 5 p.m. So every day I'm eating for 10 hours, hmm. but that 10 hours is shifting. And our body is kind of, after four or five days, it's thinking that, okay, so maybe Sachin is going to eat between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. So although I'm eating every day within 10 hours, since I'm shifting that, my body is actually expecting a 12 hours window in which I'm likely to eat. Got it. 
So that's why um, you'll see once in a while people <laughs> publish some paper saying, oh, we looked at people's one day food diary and we don't see that people who eat within 10 hours, they're healthier than people who eat within, within 16 hours. It's a little bit premature and incorrect to make that conclusion because in those cases, we're not looking at day-to-day -day variation in eating time. Uh, so just like I said, one uh, hour change in yeah. daylight saving time can <laughs> put you off track. So if you're taking your math exam calculus the day after the <laughs> daylight saving time changes, your score may be a little bit worse than if it was taken mm. before the daylight saving time. So, you, so similarly, these things do it. have some implication. So you really do have to study for a few days. For a few days, people that are that are eating on a fairly consistent schedule. Yeah, so um, that way we get a much better picture. And at the same time, I must say that um, even in mice and also in humans, the quality and quantity of nutrition matters. Yeah. And uh, although I told you all the story about high fat diet, um, we also had mice on normal chow. We call it normal chow because it's very healthy. Uh, it has enough fiber good amount of protein and good amount of fat. And mice are supposed to be stay healthy. They don't get obese or diabetic that easily. And uh, these mice, now if we think about mice that eat high fat diet, but within eight to 10 hours, um, they're protected from many diseases. But if you look at overall adiposity or obesity, that's slightly overweight than mice that eat normal chow. So that means if these mice now give up their high fat diet and eat normal chow within a short period, they will be even healthier. Hmm. So uh, that's why I always say that, yes, timing does matter, but nutrition quality also matters. And then we'll come to nutrition quantity because uh, there are also new experiments from Joe Takahashi's lab from UT Southwestern. Um, and that came out, uh, that essentially shook up all the calorie restriction field <laughs> because... Ooh, what was that study? So I, I told you that a calorie restriction or reducing calories every single day extends lifespan. And everybody agrees with that. Um, but the way those experiments are done is interesting. Mice are nocturnal, so they're supposed to eat at nighttime. And then when these calorie restriction studies are done, what they do is they put the mice on ad libitum feeding, the control mice, so that means they can eat whatever they want, whenever they want, and then they go back and weigh how much they ate. And suppose say the mice ate five grams of food. Then they take out 20%, they reduce the calorie by 20% or 40%, and then give that diet to the calorie restricted fed mice. So now you are giving three grams if it is 40% reduction, or four grams if it is 20% reduction. And um, in those days, of course, the calorie restriction field is very old, very mature, and it goes back to even days or years when people didn't think there was a circadian rhythm mm. in, in mice or humans. So they didn't pay attention to timing. It was pretty obvious and there is no fault. Um, so they would come and give the food either in the morning or late afternoon uh, to these mice. And they assumed that these mice were taking their own time to eat this. But actually, they were eating all that food within two to three hours. Hmm. So that means this calorie-restricted fed mice, if the animal technician comes at 8 a.m. in the morning, is giving food, then by 11 or noon, these mice were done <laughs> eating. So they were eating, say, maximum four hours and fasting for 20 hours. Mm. And, of course, um, we know that calorie restriction extends lifespan. So Jota Kahasi's lab um, in 2017 kind of carefully looked at calorie restriction studies and found that, no, actually, these mice are eating. They're kind of doing a time restriction eating of their own. And by that time, other people had figured out that time restricted feeding does so much benefits, these mice may actually even live longer. Um, so then the question became, are the calorie restricted mice living longer because of eating everything within four hours 
or actually reducing calories. Hmm. So then I did this um, very carefully controlled study, which has never been done before. Now he has two groups of mice. One group eats whenever he, they want this healthy diet. And suppose they ate five grams. So he reduced that calorie and he gave around four. He tried to give three and a half. I think he was trying 20% calorie reduction. Um, then he divided that food to 10 or 12 equal part. Hmm. And then gave that tiny food in every 90 minutes. Wow. Throughout 24 hours. So now there is no, uh, so they're not consolidating food. They're doing calorie restriction without time restriction. They're just, they're eating the same amount of food, but they're eating it. It's like snacking, out. little yeah. snacking throughout 24 hours. And then these mice live 10% longer than mice that ate ad libitum. Okay, so calorie reduction can increase your lifespan by 10%, or at least mouse lifespan by 10%. Now the next question was really cool because he gave that reduced calorie diet within a 12 hours window during daytime, a two hours window during daytime. Because both 12, I mean, mice, even if they're given this tiny amount of food, they will eat that right away. And within two hours, it's all gone. Hmm. And what he found was, um, yes, now these mice are living 10% extra. So that means calorie reduction gives you 10% median extension of median lifespan. And then calorie reduction and eating that within, say, two hours or 12 hours during daytime gives you another 10%. Whoa. Okay. Now the caveat is, okay, mice are nocturnal. They're actually supposed to eat at nighttime, not during daytime. <laughs> so here is the thing. You reduce calorie, and even if you're eating at the wrong time, it still gives you additional benefit. Wow. What if they're eating at the right time? Yeah. So the next group was, two groups are, the food was given during night time when the mice are supposed to eat, either in 12 hours or two hours. And those mice now live 35% longer. Oh my God. So the bottom line is, if you reduce calorie and align it to the right time, on time, then you can even extend the benefit for benefit of reduced calorie. Um, so this is with reduced calorie. Wow. So what about normal chow? If you just eat the healthy diet, you are not reducing calories, but you are eating standard diet. And this is an experiment that was done in NIH, National Institute of Health, by my dear friend and uh, really great scientist, Rafa DiCabo. And actually, Joe Takahashi, I won't say he's my dear friend. He's actually my, <laughs> my role model. Because, oh, wow. Because <laughs> I learned a lot from Joe. Mm. <laughs> and... Um, and Rafa and I are kind of contemporaries. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. <laughs> so what Rafa did, he um, he did a somewhat similar experiment. He said, well, instead of giving all five grams, I mean, I know that ad libitum fed mice eat five grams of food and let them eat whenever they want. But I would ask my lab technician to come and give that five grams of food at the same time every day. And we know that if the mice were not given food every day, they're kind of hungry overnight, uh, or, and then they will eat that five grams. And he measured that mice ate that five grams of food in 10 to 12 hours. So now these mice are eating the same number of calories, but they're also fasting for 12 to 14 hours every day. Hmm. What he found was these mice that did not reduce calorie, but ate within a short period of time, and maintain 12 to 14 hours of overnight fasting, they lived longer than mice that ate at libitum randomly. And they were also healthier. He, uh, Rafa does very careful work. Um, he went back and after every mouse diet, he would have a team of researchers who would take out every single organ and look at whether they, they had any sign of um, cancer or what happened, what was the cause of death? And they determined the cause of death in every mouse. And what they found was these mice not only lived longer, they were also healthier because there was delayed incidence of cancer and other stuff. Wow. And these were eucaloric diets? Meaning these are isocaloric diets. Wow. Yeah. So that's, uh, again, another piece of evidence. So that's why I say reducing calorie and eating it at the right time 
or not reducing calories or whatever, even if you're eating healthy yeah. diet, eating that on time at the right time. Um, or even if <laughs> mice are placed eating really crappy, um, high fat, high sucrose diet and eating within these the right time, in every instance, um, mice could improve their health. Mm. And if we go back to other literature, so for example, there are also mouse literature showing ketogenic diet, increased lifespan. If you look carefully into those papers, read carefully, you asked, did they give the ketogenic diet, leave, left it in the kids, or they were carefully giving the ketogenic diet every day? Because ketogenic diet is very difficult to handle. It's very liquidy, sticky. You can't leave it in the kids. Uh, mice will make a big mess out of it. Mm. So in fact, in many ketogenic diet study in mice, I'm not sure whether in all, but in many ketogenic diet study, they also give the food every day at the same time. And mice typically eat that ketogenic diet within a few hours. So now the question is whether what fraction of the benefit of ketogenic diet that we read in the literature and research is due to diet alone versus this mice eating all that food within few hours and then going through at least 12 to 16 hours of fasting. Hmm. So what is then the, the applicability and relevance to humans? Is it that, you know, controlling how much it's like we live in an obesogenic food environment. And so for people who are unable to really moderate the quality or quantity of food that they're eating, we still have this third variable that yes. is perhaps easier to control and, and modulate for better health, which is the timing and, and frequency with which we Yeah, we it's eat. likely. I mean, um, we should not forget that the quality and quantity, there are a lot of people. We always say that, yes, 60% uh, of people in the U.S. are overweight or obese. What are the 40%? What are they doing? Yeah. <laughs> so those 40%, uh, like you, for example... <laughs> Uh, we are paying attention to quality and quantity yeah. because uh, we try not to overeat. And if we overeat one day, then next day we're like, okay, so maybe <laughs> I, should, I should reduce today or maybe spend more time in the gym or do something. So yeah. we are paying attention to that. And also quality uh, means, I'm sure you're not eating a burger every day, no. <laughs> maybe once in a while, but you're also paying attention. So quality and quantity are important and people, a lot of people can pay attention to that. But at the end of the day, if you ask me, I can't say for sure how many calories I have consumed since morning or what is the proportion of fiber, protein, and uh, carbohydrate that I have consumed. Yeah. Um, so then if I just pay attention to time, then there are many benefits. So let's I, I'll just dial back and put this into big perspective. So now... You and I agree that there are three foundations of health that everybody should pay attention to. That's sleep, physical activity, and nutrition. When it comes to sleep, the recommendation is one should be in bed for eight hours. Most adults, I'm not saying young children and teenagers, they have to more, <laughs> sleep even more. more. Yeah. And um, so that we can get seven and a half hours of sleep. We know that there are a lot of people who don't get seven and a half hours of sleep, but there are very few clinical studies to see what is the impact of extending that sleep. Because people who are habitually sleeping less, they're sleeping less because they have too much uh, commitment or long commute or taking care of some somebody else or have a stressful job. So it's very difficult for a lot of people to extend their sleep. Then second, when it comes to exercise, of course, uh, we know that an average adult in the U.S. takes somewhere between 3,000 to 5,000 steps. Of course, one may argue that why should you stick to 10,000 steps or 15,000 steps? But the bottom line is this is a rough measure of physical activity. Yeah. And in the U.S., we typically walk from the living room to the garage. <laughs> oh, that's it, so sad. Whereas in other countries, they they walk from the home to the next bus stop or train stop. Oh God! So, so again, physical activity is very difficult to increase, and resistance training and other stuff. Only people who have time and resource to join a gym hmm. or have. So in those ways, um, a lot of people are restricted. They although they know they cannot extend sleep, they cannot improve physical activity. 
And so that's why everybody wants to focus on f- food because in every few hours we eat. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, as I said, since quality and quantity of nutrition are not easy to track for many people, I'm not saying not for all, uh, then timing becomes a very easy, straightforward thing to follow. Yeah. Because our life actually revolves around time. We plan our day every single day, keeping in mind what time we should wake up, what time is my first appointment, when is when am I going to call my mom, when am I going to see my friends? And uh, so it becomes easier to think that, okay, so just like that, I'll just put this into calendar. And actually this is already put into calendar, but by our body clock <laughs> that's already instructed that, okay, so after waking up, wait for at least one or two hours before you first eat, and then eat for eight to 10 hours because although you finish eating, your digestive system is still working. So that's why eight to 10 hours is kind of a ideal, but for many, it may not be feasible. Even if they can go 10 to 12, that may be okay. Hmm. So now um, if we look at the data, like if we look at, so we just finished one study where we asked firefighters who are doing 24 hour shift and for them, they cannot sleep longer. They cannot even sleep <laughs> throughout the night when they're on the job. Wow. It's a 24-hour shift? Yeah. Wow. So nearly 70 plus percent of full-time firefighters in the U.S. work 24-hour shift. Oof. And Shout out to firefighters. Oh, yeah. That's a tough <laughs> job. That's a very tough job. Um, actually, in our lab, uh, when we did the study, our study coordinator and staff scientist was leading the study, Emily Manugian, who is awesome. She did this beautiful study, but just she wanted to be in the, literally to be in the shoes of the firefighters. So she went to this busiest fire station in San Diego and she said, okay, so just for one day, that's 24 hours, <laughs> I report to the fire station just like everybody the all the fire firemen do and i'll live their life because they also in san diego the shift goes from 8 a.m to 8 a.m so that means you have to report around 7 30 a.m wow she reported and then she was assigned a bed to nap if she wants to and then was assigned also a specific engine and a seat and uh, so every time that engine was called to action and she had to run just like other firefighters <laughs> and put on her shoes and put on a vest and helmet and run, sit in that wow. <laughs> seat. And she has to do exactly like other firefighters so that she should not be the bottleneck hmm. and the engine has had to leave right away. So in that night, she, got, <laughs> she was called into 10 calls. That doesn't mean that she was woken up 10 times, she was actually woken up more number of times because every time a 911 call comes, the siren goes, everybody wakes up and then they want to see whose engine is called because there are three or four engines in the fire station. Hmm. Only if your engine is called, then you have to run. Otherwise you can go back to sleep. But just imagine if just you are getting, woken up yeah. and not only you are waking up and you have to wake up and look to <laughs> see whether your engine is called. You have to be attentive. And she did that, and then <laughs> next day morning, after eight o'clock shift, she came back and she said, "Well, I don't know how these guys do it. Mm. I mean, every day." Wait, uh, why do they have twenty-four hour shifts though? That like, well, um, is, there, is there like a reason for that? Yeah, so that's a, a good question. The thing is, um, you know, when you go on a call, some calls can take two or three hours, mm. and then uh, if and every time there is a shift change. Then the firefighters who are finishing this shift, they also have to update about the engine and everything to the next shift. Mm. And if you do that in every 12 hours, then you're essentially taking away two, roughly two hours okay. just for updating and passing on the baton. Uh, and if they're on a call, then again, uh, that delays. So maybe I guess that's the reason. Mm. Um, but we have to call, <laughs> we have to ask the firefighters. That seems <laughs> suboptimal. Yeah, we got to get a firefighter on here to. Well, actually, there are some there are some firefighters who stay on forty eight or seventy two hours shift. Wow! Um, because unfortunately, what is happening is many cities, for example, San Francisco, and many cities are so expensive 
that firefighters and many um, many shift worker who can whose service we need they cannot afford to live in the city hmm. so that's why they commute and when they are commuting 50 60 miles each way then it becomes suboptimal for them to commute every day so rather they would do they would come to the fire station and live there for 3 days or 2 days and then go back it's so odd that so many of society's most valued professions uh entail such brutal hours and like such inhumane work you know work conditions like i i think about i don't know anything about the firefighting universe but i know that like medical doctors you know the like when in the training to go into medicine it's like crazy shifts being underslept like the brain is not performing optimally under those conditions yeah so uh, when we think about um, our daily life actually without shift workers the modern society cannot survive hmm. starting from when you wake up until you go back to sleep or even throughout your sleep there are people working to make our life uh, to make the society move so hmm. for example uh when you wake up and go to the bakery and get this fresh muffin or fresh croissant uh the chef the baker actually woke up pretty early and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> might have come to the <laughs> come to bake that at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning you're right and uh when you go uh, if you're taking public if somebody is taking public transport and going to catch the train or the bus that driver actually came few hours before um you showed up mm. even when you're checking in in the morning even if i have a 6 o'clock flight i go and i typically ask so uh, when when does your shift start and uh-huh. then they will say that okay so they usually come in around 4 o'clock and then if you go to if you if you're watching your morning news just imagine the newscaster and then the whole team they actually wake up somewhere between 2 and 3 in the morning and they come there so a modern society cannot survive without shift workers. Wow. So that's why when we did the study we actually called this study as healthy heroes. Hmm. Because shift workers are truly the heroes. I was call, I was going to call them the guardian of the galaxy. But <laughs> 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 oh, I don't well Hollywood will come up to me. So. <laughs> Yeah, so we called it healthy heroes. Well, story. they are the heroes of society. <laughs> yeah. God bless shift workers. Yeah. So, um I even forgot how I got into this, but <laughs> how I got into this discussion. <laughs> but we are talking about 10 hours. So, in this study, we actually asked them to log every food that they ate. So, they took a picture, um, they described something and um it was using this my circadian clock app and firefighters do have a sense of humor. So, <laughs> once in a while we'd see uh, somebody uh, logging um having a uh, having a blast with my friends that's all is it um and then we go back to the food picture and we realize that this guy is eating a hamburger fries and beer and then <laughs> the next one we see <laughs> they'll take a picture and tag don't judge me <laughs> <laughs> so we get all kinds of pictures so they were very truthful in saying what the lot and another thing that they we also realized that firefighters have a very strong sense of brotherhood and sisterhood um they have strong bond because they know that everybody is going through the same stress and they need to have this social support system or brotherhood and sisterhood at work because we often forget that people who are actually having a regular job we spend typically more number of wakeful hours at work than with our family hmm. and uh, they realize it very quickly so they make sure that that wakeful hours they are spending at work is good by maintaining good relationship with their coworkers so then when this um heard about the study and participated they realized that um the study results will be one that disseminated to all their brothers and sisters. Hmm. Uh so then <laughs> they had the extra responsibility they felt that they have to be true to the study protocol whatever we ask them they have to <laughs> they should do. <laughs> That's and, funny. And and which is really interesting because if you go back to clinicaltrial.gov which tracks all clinical trials that are done almost most of the world not all um 
at least all the clinical trials in the U.S. are registered there. Then you will find nearly 435,000 clinical trials. But what is interesting is most clinical trials exclude shift workers mm. because um, we know that shift work screws up our circadian rhythm. Circadian rhythm screws up all organ systems, so they may not respond favorably to drugs. So that's why they are often excluded from drug trials. And then for lifestyle intervention, whether it's exercise or nutrition, they're also ex excluded because they know that, okay, shift workers may not show up for their clinic visit, may not be able to follow the protocol. So the number one or one of the top exclusion criteria in most clinical trial is shift work. Whereas shift workers account for 20%, at least 20% of the workforce. Interesting. So a lot of the a lot of the research that we have on, I mean, any number of in any number of fields and areas are not necessarily applicable to 20% of the population. Yeah. It's and 20% is an underestimate because for example, your DoorDash delivery guys or the food delivery guys or um, uh, Uber driver, Lyft drivers, they are not considered as card carrying shift workers. Mm. And then there are some jobs where it's actually a regular job, but people do a lot of overtime. So daytime security guards, they, they prefer to do some nighttime overtime because they get extra paid. And they're not necessarily counted as shift workers. So if we count then the uh, actual number of people who live the life of a shift worker may be pretty high. And just imagine the all the high school and college students, they live the life of a shift worker. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so that's one thing that they're excluded. Then you ask, okay, so how many studies are actually done on shift workers to figure out what's wrong with them or to improve this? It's less than 1,000. Hmm. Okay, so we go from 435,000 to less than 1,000. Then you ask, how many interventions are to improve with the intention to improve their health? And that's less than 100. So in that way, once you do a study on shift worker, then that result is more likely to be followed by shift work community and NIOS, National Institute of Occupational Health and Safety. Um, they are also likely to pay attention to it. So yeah, because it's specific to them. It's very specific. So, so our shift workers paid too much attention and they were very um, good in logging. And what we found was when they ate within 10 hours, without paying attention, they actually improved their diet quality and also reduced a little bit of uh, calorie intake. So they reduced specifically alcohol intake. And for shift workers, alcohol is a big problem because they're under so much of stress that they often drink excess uh, caffeine and sometimes to relieve stress, they also consume alcohol, mm. which again exacerbates their trauma and other depression, anxiety-like behavior. So that's why there is active um, interest in reducing alcohol intake among shift workers. And we're pleased to see that they actually significantly reduced the alcohol intake, which translates to, I think, half a drink per day or something on and out. It's, mm. it's over a lot of people. So this is uh, one example where you're trying to reduce your eating interval and fixing it to 10 hours or 11 hours, but inadvertently you may reduce alcohol intake, you may reduce even dessert and all this junk food we eat late at night. So in that way, what we think in many human studies, and we are also seeing that whenever there is a eight hours or nine hours time restricted eating, uh, people are inadvertently reducing calorie intake, sometimes by 20%. And why this is exciting is, um, you know, National Institute of Health, which also funds a lot of my research, and I'm extremely grateful because NIH is 
an IH fund comes from honest taxpayers' money. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> right? So when you're doing research, we actually, it's not government money. <laughs> I think, of, okay, so this is... Taxpayers' money. <laughs> taxpayers' well, money. Well, that's one area where I'm happy to see my taxes go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I always say, I always think that, okay, so we are really privileged in this society because we... Means every time I go to a grocery store, I look at the checkout counter clock <laughs> and I realize, okay, so he's a taxpayer and <laughs> I am actually using doing research with my with their money happy to give it to you sachin <laughs> <laughs> so um um i'm going yeah so many uh, studies now that are um, done we're seeing this calorie reduction and why this is exciting is nih few years ago they had tried to do calorie reduction study where they really screened very meticulously to make sure that they are recruiting people who are more likely to reduce their calorie because you know if you if you recruit somebody who is already eating a lot and has five or six drinks a week that person is not going to reduce calorie and stick to it for two years so they recruited uh, very carefully and they did this study called calorie two because it was for two years and it was also the second big study like that and there are nearly 110 or 115 um, people who were supposed to reduce calorie by 25% and keep the calories low for two years. And it's not a easy study because they have to be monitored regularly and there are a lot of millions of dollars went into that study. And they figured out that even these highly selected group of people who are more likely to stay healthy they could not achieve 25% calorie reduction. Hmm. Actually ended up achieving somewhere between 12 to 20% calorie reduction. So then the question is, well, you put so much effort into counting calorie counseling and all that stuff, and you achieved, say, 12 to 15%. Of course, that is over two years. I must say that it was over two years. And... If you can just tell people, try to eat within 8 to 10 hours, and if they achieve the same calorie reduction, then that will be exciting. That would be amazing. Because the cost of intervention now goes down, and uh, it also becomes easier because, you know, calorie 2 was done on population who are English speaker. And there are many um, constituents in our population who don't speak English, cannot understand that fluently, and also there are a lot of nutrition information that are not available as easily in other languages. Right. So that's why um, at least many NIH-funded researchers and also uh, many philanthropists and uh, leaders in the field are super excited about time restricting, uh, not necessarily because of the circadian rhythm, but as a mean to reduce calorie can take and maybe improve nutrition quality by reducing alcohol or reducing um, junk food, late night junk food eating. So um, that's why when you see time restricted eating studies coming out these days, and if you pay attention, you'll often see that these many studies achieve somewhere between 5 to 20% calorie reduction. And then people start to wonder, hey, <laughs> is the benefit due to calorie redu reduction? or timing. And uh, that's where also there are some really good studies done. Uh, one is from, again, my friend, Courtney Peterson. She's a young rising star in, um, who is well-trained in nutrition. She's actually, she has a degree in actually physics or math, but then. Wow. <laughs> um, and she did this very careful study where she invited participants to eat all their food in front of a camera, <laughs> so that she can watch them, like big sister watching yeah. <laughs> every meal. Wow. Or they had to come to the clinic uh, and then eat in front of her, means not in front of her, in front of the study yeah. team. And they had to maintain their body weight. So that means there was no significant change in calories so that they would gain weight or lose weight. And in that study, of course, it's difficult to do, so only eight or 10 people. Um, when these people reduce their eating window to six hours, uh, that was also a little extreme because we cannot expect people to stick to six hours over many, many weeks. But again, this is in clinic studies. So 
um, what she found was, although these people did not change weight, re- did not reduce body weight, there's a significant improvement in their blood glucose regulation. That's important. So that, um, you know, when it comes to health, yeah, most of us can relate our health to three fundamental parameters. How is your blood sugar? How is your bo- blood cholesterol and blood pressure? And what she found was within this very short period of time, few weeks, people maintain their body weight, but they improve their better cell function, pancreas function. So insulin became more effective. Hmm. And they also reduced their blood pressure and both systolic and diastolic blood pressure reduced. Wow. And many other studies have also shown that people who are unhealthy and who habitually eat for a very long window of time when they reduce that window to eight to 10 hours, they do see benefits in blood sugar, blood pressure, and in many studies, blood cholesterol. Without changing food quality or quantity. Because we're not giving them uh, any advice on food quality or quantity or measuring that. In I, 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 So in Courtney's um, research, there is no change in quality, quantity, uh, of food. Hmm. So the quality and quantity were maintained, was adjusted so that they maintain that body weight. Hmm. But in other studies where they're asked to eat within a shorter period of time, people lose weight because they're reducing some calories and inadvertently they may be improving nutrition quality. But the end result, when it comes to what is the end result of health, then people see improvement in blood sugar, blood pressure, and in many cases, blood cholesterol. Particularly, the cholesterol takes long time, uh, more than three months, but they do see. Another exciting thing about time ratio eating that people often forget is we would stick to lifestyle habits that actually make us more feel more energetic or feel better about ourselves. And in many cases of time ratio eating studies, particularly when it is so between eight to 10 hours. I'm not talking about four hours time restricting or six hours because that can give people headache and nausea. So those have been reported. But eight to 10 hours, these people report better sleep. Hmm. Um, and it's not that they're sleeping for a long number of hours. The sleep is better quality. Um, in one study we found every, every day, every morning when they woke up, through the My Circadian Clock app, they had to say how they slept. If they slept well, a smiley face. If they slept <laughs> bad, then a grumpy face. And if it is grumpy face, then we ask, uh, was it difficulty falling asleep, fragmented sleep, or you felt like you had insufficient sleep? What we saw was within this 12 weeks intervention, we saw 28% of time they improved their sleep. So their sleep self-perceived sleep quality improved by 28%. Wow. Um, but when we go back and look at their sleep record, because we also put a sleep tracking device on their wrist, we don't see that they are actually increasing their sleep time. But, um, and you, you and I might have, we always experience that. Sometimes we sleep the same seven hours, we feel great the next yeah. day. And sometimes we don't. And it seems that people who eat very close to their bedtime, they're the ones who are likely to have bad quality sleep. Interesting. And uh, this is something interesting uh, that we have been seeing consistently, that time ratio eating improves sleep. We don't know the mechanism. We don't know why. So a lot of people ask me, well, I'm healthy weight. Should I be doing time ratio eating? I don't have any blood cholesterol, blood sugar, blood pressure problem. And then I asked, do you want to feel more energetic in the morning? (laughs) Do you want to feel like you slept better? And if so... Um, then this is also another reason why you should do it. But it's also hard to go to sleep when you're hungry. Yeah, so there are two different types of hunger. So for example, if you if somebody is habitually eating very close to bedtime, and if that person wants to change habit, then it will become difficult for the first one or two weeks. And we warn them that, look, when you start, you will feel hungry. If you're finishing dinner three to four hours or two to three hours before bedtime, if it was not your habit, uh, because your brain 
has been trained over long, many, many years to feel hungry at that time. Got it. But it will take two weeks or so to retrain your brain so that you don't feel hungry. And that's exactly what people experience mm. once they know that this is going to get better. So it's essentially like better. food withdrawal that yeah, some it's people like food withdrawal. interpret as hunger. Yeah. Which so, feels like, I mean, for all intents and purposes, it is yeah, hunger, yeah. but it's not that you're necessarily hungry for calories. Yeah, yeah. You're just, your body wants what it what it is expecting. Yeah. And also, another thing is, we. Uh, this will be interesting to see whether whether the hunger circuit is, uh, is kind of at a different threshold, so that even if you, you're a little bit low energy, it's, it's like saying, okay, so you got to go and eat that big meal. Whereas um, during time restricted eating, maybe we are retraining the hunger circuit because um, recently we published a paper um, where we looked at what is the impact of time restricted eating in different tissues and brain regions in mouse. And the biggest change that we see is in hypothalamus. So this is the, the bottom of the brain, at the base of the brain that actually controls many things of fluid balance, our hunger, satiety, a you know, lot of things. It's like the most primordial part it's of the our brain. It's the most primordial part of the brain, which is conserved in many species. And um, in fact, if you if somebody's hypothalamus is screwed up, particularly you know people with um, glioblastoma or sorry, many kinds of brain tumor, particularly kids, uh, they can actually get cured if the surgery is done properly. But if that is in hypothalamus, and if by some events when these surgeons are doing these operations, um, of course, many times they're very careful, but sometimes they can damage some part of hypothalamus to have access to the tumor. And what we're seeing is some if there is some damage to this hunger satiety center or some of these centers that control our um, fluid level and other stuff, then those people have lifelong problem with hunger satiety. So... So coming back to this mouse study, what we find is there's a huge change among all the brain regions. Hypothalamus has the biggest change in the number of genes that are turned on or off in response to time restricting. So that's why we think that the after a few days of time restricting, our brain may be rewiring itself or reprogramming our hunger, satiety, and other brain function to cope up or to better optimize hmm. for this. Fascinating. People love to compare time-restricted eating with calorie restriction, but going back to the studies that you that you referenced, does it seem to be the case that it's just more difficult in an ad libitum feeding environment stretched out over the course of the 16 hours that your average person is awake to moderate their consumption? There seems to be the signal that it's easier to achieve the same degree of calorie restriction but by just thinking about the timing of your food, yeah, your so eating. it's uh, yeah, so it's it's possible that um, by without counting calories, if you count time, you may be able to reduce calories, and this happens a lot. Means I have um, again another uh, scientific hero of mine is Ron Evans, who is a Lasker Award winner and is is considered the god of nuclear hormone receptors. So there are these fifty or so um, master regulator of transcription. So these are the proteins that control a lot of our genes relevant to metabolism, reproductive function, uh, brain function. And in fact, when I was studying at Salk, he had this very influential paper showing all the nuclear hormone receptors, these master regulators of gene expression or function, um, they go up and down in a rhythmic fashion in different cells and different organs. And then he was almost prophetic, <laughs> almost 15 years ago, saying mm. metabolism is circadian and circadian is metabolism. So the biggest role of met uh, circadian rhythm is to control metabolism so that we are programmed to eat at a certain time and break down, detoxify at other times. And looking back, what Ron said, <laughs> mm. at that time, I was thinking, no, circadian is more than metabolism. It's about behavior and all that stuff. But now I think, yeah, Ron was right. I mean, oh, <laughs> it's so interesting. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm sure some people 
really uh, like it, it's it's practical for them and they enjoy tracking and, and counting calories and all and all that. But it is really comforting to know that for others for whom that is maybe less easy or intuitive, that thinking purely about the timing of their of their meal consumption might achieve the same goal. Yeah, but um, again, going back to people who are actually counting calories, um, just like I said, the mouse experiment, these mice were given the same reduced calorie. Oh, yeah. But if they're eating at the wrong time, they're not getting the best out of their all this effort to reduce calorie, count calories. Like the longevity, like all the longevity benefit, diet and longevity benefit, and the and the impact on blood pressure and blood glucose, yeah, and cholesterol, all of that. So just imagine, like if you're eating healthy food, that's fine. Just compare it with your best friend. If your best friend comes and knocks on your door at two o'clock in the morning, every single day, I don't think that person <laughs> will be your best friend anymore. No. <laughs> Yeah, just like a visitor at the wrong time is yeah. your enemy. <laughs> I'd call the police. <laughs> yeah. Similarly, uh, healthy food at the wrong time is junk. Mm. So that's why healthy food should be also on time. <laughs> healthy food at the wrong time is junk. Yeah. Okay, so what are the best times then? Like when is the most optimal time to eat for if you're a human? Yeah. So Looking to optimize health. Yeah, so this is where um, you know we have to think about the whole 24 hours rhythm. And, and how it operates and how it will have impact on overall health. And this is where, again, you know, I'm speaking on behalf of many scientists who have worked in this area. And also, uh, for example, at Salk, which is an awesome place to do science, um, the nice thing is we, we have many uh, colleagues who work on different aspects of nutrition in the sense, for example, my colleague uh, Ruben Shaw, who heads the cancer center at Salk, his work on AMPK, uh, which is AMP kinase, which is the target of this drug metformin. And we know that we have to increase the boost the function of AMP kinase to stay healthy, live longer. And his insight into AMPK played into <laughs> also my uh, work on time restricted eating, because uh, AMP kinase function actually oscillates uh, and it's tied to circadian rhythm. He and Ron Evans showed that. And then my other colleague, Mark Montmoney, um, who is again a National Academy science member, and he had shown that uh, some of the hunger hormone, for example, glucagon, um, they have a strong circadian function. So for example, this hunger hormone glucagon, if you uh, expose mice to this hormone by injecting a little bit of extra, then that will trigger a hunger program um, and they, these mice should break down more glucose to cope up, or glycogen to cope up with the hunger signal. But if you inject the same hunger hormone throughout the day at different time, then when the mouse is not expecting this hunger hormone, although the mouse is hungry, you won't show the same metabolic effect. Mm. So all of this kind of got into... Uh, our research. And same thing, in uh, Salk, we have very small number of PIs so we can talk to each other. And can. And similarly, I have Terry Sanoski who works on the brain and um, he was also <laughs> another scientific hero because he's one of the very few people who are on the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine. And he was also prophetic a few years ago, almost 15, 20 years ago, saying that well, the sleep and circadian rhythm optimization will have the huge impact on health, and he hypothesized certain things. And then we, we kind of, over the last few years, we have combined this and also research from the field of melatonin, and we'll get to that. And um, so if we put all of this together, and then my previous research on light that's still going on, then I think we need six simple steps. <laughs> okay, so let's start with step number one is your day actually begins from the time you went to bed last time, last night. Hmm. Because what time, and we all agree that if I go to bed at two o'clock tonight, tomorrow is screwed. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So your day actually begins the time you go to bed. So that's why try to go to bed at a consistent time and stick to it. Because going to bed at a consistent time 
also tells your circadian clock that this is the time you're going to bed and all these other functions um, that happens at nighttime will continue at the right time. So try to go to bed at consistent time and be in bed for eight hours so that you get seven to seven and a half hours of restorative sleep. How much leeway would you say we have there? Because I try to go to bed between around 10.30 and 11 o'clock at night these days. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah? That's fine because, you know, um, um, the body also has some leeway. Mm. Uh, The clock has a little bit of leeway. You know, when we go to bed and when we're sleeping, there are, throughout our sleep, different things happen at a, almost like a concert orchestra, like in the first few hours, our growth hormone levels will peak. And the growth hormones will signal the rest of the body that, hey, this guy is asleep. It's time to repair. Um, And then after a few hours, our uh, brain will detoxify itself. So there is this glymphatic system um, that was discovered only in the last few years. And that is essentially uh, the garbage trucks taking all the toxin from our brain and draining that. Then our synaptic functions are um, plasticity and then the uh, learning and memory function that will also improve during sleep. So that's why uh, this is very important that we sleep properly. And if we don't sleep, then what happens is we know that the next day we feel cranky. What is the definition of crankiness? The thing is we are not processing correctly the information that is coming in. And Maybe we're not even listening or sensing the information that's presented to us. We're not processing that internally in our brain properly. And we're not reacting uh, in terms of deciding what to say, how much to say, (laughs) what tone to use to say. Oh, yeah. (laughs) All that stuff. And if you think of decision making, essentially what is happening is we are not um, perceiving and processing information to arrive at a decision. And when you think about decision, the biggest decision we make, almost everybody makes throughout the day, is what to eat, how much to eat, when to eat, with whom to eat, when to stop eating. <laughs> it's certainly one of the most, one of the more important decisions we make. Yeah, yeah. So in that way, if you don't sleep properly, then the next day we are more likely to eat unhealthy food mm. because we cannot make decision. Even though we know that healthy food is good, we cannot make good decisions. And it's a lot. It's something like, if I recall correctly, about like 400 to 500 yeah. additional calories. Yeah, yeah. So if we don't sleep properly, then we, we consume that extra calories. Uh, so that's number one. And why? Wait, what, could, if we... So you mentioned all these wonderful things that happen like uh, the the spike in growth hormone, um, which uh, uh, you know, f- according to my to my knowledge, it ha- that happens earlier in the night. Yeah, that happens earlier. In the night. If we delay sleep, if we're if we typically so for me, for example, if I'm going to bed right now between ten thirty and eleven o'clock at night, and on a Friday night I go out and I end up going to sleep at one in the morning. Do I, does that growth hormone spike and all the other things that, that happen at the beginning of sleep, do those still happen or do, did I have, do I miss out on those? So this growth hormone release is circadian regulated. So that means when something is circadian regulated, that means the clock is expecting you to sleep at that time. And if you sleep at that time, then you'll get the reward. It's almost like if you're on time, you'll get this reward. And mm. if you're not on time, then your know, reward will be less. It'll be less. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Or it may not happen. So... So that's why. Uh, so even if you get the same duration of sleep, if I go to bed at like one in the morning, yeah. and then you know on the on Saturday morning I yeah. I, yeah. I sleep in until we'll say like ten a.m. or something or or, or nine a.m., I'm still getting the same duration of sleep, but I'm I'm really shortchanging. You're shortchanging many things because the things that are uh, clock regulated because there was a time for you to get the benefit if you. Yeah. Went to bed at the same time, so the benefit will be reduced. So it's almost like that. So, And you'll also feel that, suppose say your habitual sleep time is from, say, 11 till 6 or 7 in the morning. And then the night when you go to bed at 1 or 2, your sleep quality in the second half of your sleep, uh, because in the second half you're essentially sleeping when you're supposed to be awake. Right. So your clock was ready to wake you up. But because of the sleep debt or the tiredness you are sleeping, you may not get good quality of sleep. And we know that. I mean, sometimes I also, when I have jet lag, I might sleep extra, but that extra sleep is not the same quality. I mean, 
wake up for an hour or so, 15 minutes, and then I would go back to sleep and I'm in REM sleep and all that happened. So wow. this is, um, and again, anything, when, when, we say, when we talk about hormones that spike at nighttime when you're in our sleep, these are not easy experiments to do, even in mice. So we are talking about experiments that are possible maybe in three to four places in the U.S., and for those experiments, you need to have healthy volunteers who are willing to go and sleep there. And not only sleep, they're actually hooked up to a catheter. <laughs> and then somebody outside the room is kind of literally draining your blood in every 20 <laughs> to 30 minutes of one hour and checking which hormones are spiking, how's your blood glucose, how's your... So these labs are really instrumental and critical in giving us all this insight that we know. Having said that, when we say, like the example that you said, Gabe, it's difficult to do those experiments. So that's why many of the things that we say sometimes, a kind of interpretation saying, yeah, we know that that's clock regulated. It's also fasting regulated. For example, if you fast for one day and you go to sleep, your growth hormone will actually begin to rise even before you you go to sleep, and you'll have overall, the growth hormone remains high throughout the first half of the sleep. So you'll even get extra boost of mm. growth hormone. And that experiment was done in 80s. Mm. And we still use that <laughs> to interpret many effect of fasting, benefit of fasting on growth hormone and the stuff. So unfortunately, <laughs> the circadian research is, uh, particularly in humans, is extremely expensive because you have to sample things in every 20 minutes to 30 minutes or one hour. And uh, some of the stuff that we say is based on experiments that were done like two, three decades ago or sometimes 10 years ago. And wow. sometimes it's based on eight or 10 people. And uh, But these are difficult experiments. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> it's interesting what you say about growth hormone and fasting. I remember yeah. writing about that in my first book, Genius Foods, there's a, it, it shoots up, I think after 24 hours of fasting, something like 2000%. Yeah, it shoots up a lot. Even during daytime when we are not supposed to have growth hormone, uh, it slowly rises and then wow. by bedtime it. So uh, so now we, we have gone through one yeah. and it's really good that we have all this discussion yeah. because there's You're so much. You're changing my life, by the way. This is <laughs> this is fascinating. I'm gonna be such a, I'm, I'm, gonna, become, I'm gonna be a sleep Nazi after this <laughs> on schedule. <laughs> Like a German train. <laughs> okay, we'll yeah. see. <laughs> yeah, 10.30 at night. Here we go. Okay, so yeah. now we're up to number two. Number two is um, after waking up, uh, wait for at least one or two hours before your first meal. Because this is the time when our night hormones are going down, and day hormones are going up. And I call this the changing of the guards. Hmm. And uh, this is the time when even if you eat, your body is not prepared to digest food properly and absorb that glucose properly. Uh, this goes back to, I told you about melatonin. And we always think melatonin is this night hormone that puts us to sleep and all that stuff. And that's right. And melatonin is produced by our pineal gland. And in fact, melatonin, almost every hormone in our body has a circadian rhythm or diurnal rhythm, uh, but most of the hormones are affected by other stuff. So for example, our hunger hormone, although it has circadian rhythm, if we feel more hungry, it'll have effect. Just like we talked about growth hormone, although it peaks at night, if we are fasting, then it'll rise more. But melatonin is a very interesting hormone. It rises only at nighttime and is affected by only light. So if there is too much light, then light goes through our retina and affects melatonin. Uh, it reduces melatonin production. Um, so people have done these experiments, again, with healthy volunteers who went to live in the lab for 14, 15 days. And uh, these researchers in uh, um, the one that I looked up uh, was actually from Kenichi Honma's lab. And uh, Dr. Honma is considered a big leader in circadian rhythm because 
he started researching circadian rhythm in model organisms and also in humans starting from 80s <laughs> so and uh uh so harma sensei mm. <laughs> uh did this experiment where the people came and then he was collecting um plasma i'm not sure whether plasma or saliva melatonin samples every one hour and what he beautifully showed um of course i must say that there are many other researchers who have done these experiments i'm just giving this example yeah um what he found was yes around 2 to 3 hours before these people went to bed the melatonin began to rise and we know that that happens but after they woke up even if there there was bright light it took almost 2 to 4 hours in some cases 4 hours by at least 2 hours for the melatonin levels to drop and come back to baseline and why this is important is um over t- now 15 years ago there was a very interesting discovery from studying human genetics again this is um another good friend of mine richa sakshana at harvard medical school richa was looking at uh, what causes people to become obese and diabetic and um as she was looking at thousands of people who had their genome information available and she did this genome wide association studies or gwas and to her utter surprise she found that there is a mutation in this protein called melatonin receptor b um for simplicity uh, when people had that mutation then they are more likely to be diabetic and obese and it didn't make sense because melatonin was linked to sleep and then people's knee jerk reaction was oh yeah we know that people who sleep less or <laughs> they may have obesity or diabetes um but in the subsequent years other researchers and also um richa in collaboration with other people um many researchers now have at least one mechanism why this happens um first day, so melatonin although it's a hormone every hormone needs is and hormones are like keys and there has to be a lock to open so we call these locks as hormone receptors and melatonin can unlock or has two receptors melatonin receptor a or b and this hormone receptor um was also present in the pancreas hmm. we think that okay melatonin is a sleep hormone the targets or receptors should be only in the brain uh, which is not true present everywhere almost everywhere but um it was in the pancreas and then um there are now quite a few theories how melatonin might affect blood sugar regulation but one theory that is uh most people agree on it's not that universally everybody agrees <laughs> on because that's what happens it in nev- science it nobody, never is <laughs> you know it is is melatonin binds to this receptor and then tells the pancreas to sleep mm. metabolically of course <laughs> so yeah. that, that means the pan is telling okay so now is the night time i don't think this guy is going to get up in the night and eat food so it's time for you to go and repair yourself so you should not expect any glucose so even if glucose comes uh, since you'll be sleeping don't produce enough insulin mm. uh, that's almost the layman um explanation of what happens and then this mutation actually makes this receptor more sensitive to melatonin so even tiny bit of melatonin can activate this receptor and say hey go to sleep now wow so so that means um throughout the day suppose say a melatonin is pretty low almost undetectable quantity or you can say that and then say 3 hours after before our bedtime melatonin begins to rise we call it the dim light melatonin onset because people who do these experiments they know that melatonin can be suppressed by light so if you if i want to know your melatonin natural melatonin rhythm then i would bring you to lab ask you to be in dim light from 6 pm onwards you'll have only candlelight <laughs> <laughs> sounds romantic section <laughs> <laughs> but you know, so you have where are we all, going with this <laughs> <almost>. <laughs> well then you'll <he'll> sleep so. 
<laughs> because dim light will make you sleep. So usually they have five to ten lux of light. So it's equivalent to having five candles in your bedroom or something like that. So, <laughs> so in that light, that light is not enough to suppress your melatonin uh, if it is programmed to turn on by the clock. So that's was, probably because we evolved with campfires yeah. where we've had them for some time. And so if, the, if a campfire, not sometimes, actually out of 200,000 years of our human history, only in the last 150 years, we have electrical lighting. Crazy. So, <laughs> only 100 years, actually, because before that, it was so expensive to have electrical lighting that only very few people could afford it. So wow. only in the last 100, 120 years, we have electrical lighting. So anyway, so you um, do dim light melatonin assay. So it's not that it's rom romantic because you'll be hooked up either to a bloodline oh, God. <laughs> to get your melatonin <laughs> or somebody will come and swab your saliva and take oh, that no. <laughs> in every one hour or half an hour. And then what people have seen is... Some people out there probably into that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not my thing. Yeah. What people uh, have seen is three hours, suppose say three hours before your bedtime, your melatonin will become detectable, like it will rise at least 10%, 20%. So now, when that melatonin begins to rise, it's also telling your pancreas that uh, slow down. If you eat food now, and this person is not likely to eat food, so don't produce insulin. So those people who are normal, who don't have this allele, uh, for them, it may be okay to eat even three hours before bedtime and they will have normal glucose response. But for people who have this mutation, it's so sensitive that even tiny rise in melatonin can engage and with the lock or the receptor and tell the pancreas, no, 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 you got to slow down now. This person is most likely to sleep soon. Wow. <laughs> and for them, those who have this mutation, they actually have to be even more careful because if they eat um, close to their bedtime, their glucose will go even more. So it's like every evening people with this mutation have, yeah. they develop, it's like full-blown type 2 diabetes Yeah, so actually, every evening. <laughs> actually, there used to be a term called evening diabetes because this is not new phenomena. People had seen this phenomena for a long time. And if you look at um, endocrinology textbook, which were actually, I means this is the um, revised edition, but if you go back to even original edition, um, people knew that if a healthy person comes to the lab, comes to clinic and you do this uh, glucose tolerance test where you drink a bunch of sugary drink and then almost 70 grams of sugar or so, and then for the next two to three hours, they measure your blood glucose level, you may be healthy in the morning. But if you go in the evening with the same 12 hours fast before, they may find you diabetic because your blood sugar will remain high and will not come down that easily. Wow. So there is a term called evening diabetes. So mm. you can be okay to consume a lot of sugar in the morning or first half of the day, your pancreas is working, pumping really good amount of insulin, but in the evening, close to your bedtime, this might happen. I actually, another um, close friend of mine, Frank Sear, who is also at Harvard, uh, and Marta Garulet, who is at Spain, they collaborated on the tested this by taking people and, and genotyping them for melatonin receptor. And they found that those who had this mutation are more likely to have this insulin resistance or kind of pre-diabetes or diabetes-like phenotype if they ate too late at night. Mm. So that was in the evening. But this research has not extended to morning. If you get up early in the morning and right after getting up, if you have a cup of tea or coffee with a couple of teaspoons of sugar, because you know one gram, one teaspoon of sugar is five grams of sugar. And if you take all of my blood, you'll find five grams of sugar because my blood sugar level should be 100 milligram per 100 milliliter. And this is something that I wrote in this book, my second book, The Circadian Diabetes Code. Um, the 100 milligram, we always think, how does it relate to our, my total blood sugar? Uh, so the number to remember is 100 milligram per 100 milliliter or one deciliter. And typically I would have five liters of blood. So that's five grams of sugar. So when I'm adding one teaspoon of sugar, that's five grams of sugar. And if insulin is not at all produced and I'm just lying 
sedentary, doing nothing, theoretically, my blood sugar level will just double wow. with that teaspoon of sugar. Of course, it doesn't happen because um, a pancreas kicks in or a muscle absorbs some sugar. So my point is, if you wake up in the morning, you have this melatonin still in our system for at least one or two hours. That's enough to reduce our insulin production. And then second, we are programmed to have a peak cortisol, the stress hormone cortisol level, right when we wake up. And in fact, when we wake up, we kind of run or we are stressed, hey, this email or text or whatever it is. So in fact, our cortisol peak actually reaches for most modern humans, maybe 30, 40, one hour after we wake up, up to one hour. And we know that cortisol is really bad for glucose metabolism. So that's why we have two things. We have high melatonin, I means relatively high. It is not really peak, but it's still going down. And we have a cortisol peak, both of which are not good for glucose regulation. Mm. So that's why we say that, yeah, it may be good to avoid food for one to two hours before waking up, because by that time, your system, your melatonin is low, your pancreas is pumped up, your digestive system is also good to digest food and your cortisol levels are on the decline, so there may not be any harm. So that's the rule number two. Rule number two, if you have to eat, yeah. would it uh, make sense then to choose something that's uh, perhaps lower in glycemic index and load, like prote yeah, so protein, fiber, fat, or it we, doesn't? We don't know because, you know, when you say, um, we don't typically drink only protein it's because if you look at most of the protein drinks, um, they are rich in protein, I agree, but there is always some carb to make it palatable. Right. Um, so in that way, uh, it'll be interesting to put a continuous glucose monitor Yeah. and then drink the same protein drink immediately after waking up versus maybe two hours after mm. and then see what happens. People should do that. I mean, if you're, you guys listening... I'm sure some people in the audience have, are, you know, are are wearing these things, right? Because yeah, they're yeah, not popular. Yeah. Okay, so we've gotten to. Oh wait, just real quick. Yeah. Um, before we get to three, you mentioned that light. How does light affect this this morning melatonin? Like, what is the optimal um, light exposure upon waking to optimize your your circadian rhythm? Yeah. So light actually suppresses our melatonin level. So um, you can use it to your advantage um, and uh, you know almost 20 now 20 years ago <laughs> we discovered the light receptor melanopsin um, and the reason why it is called melanopsin and we have melatonin is because melanopsin and melatonin are also present in frog skin frog skin yeah and uh, melatonin because it tones the melanosomes of frog skin. So that's why it's called melatonin. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Melanopsin is because it's an opsin or light receptor that was originally discovered to be present in frog melanosomes. It was by Iggy Provencio, who is again my scientific hero because he introduced me to the science of melanopsin. So in frogs, um, melanopsin senses bright sunlight and essentially acts through melatonin to um, disperse the pigment so that the frog skin becomes darker. Okay, so now, so the same thing happens, uh, not the same thing, but similar connection exists between melanopsin and melatonin in humans and in rodents. So that is um, when melanopsin is activated, mostly like by blue light, then it can tell the pineal gland through an indirect neural connection that, um, okay, now it's time to stop melatonin production. So now if we go back to what kind of light and what intensity, what we know is daylight or sunlight is the richest source of blue light. So the bottom line is if you're waking up, the first thing you can do it's just open the curtain and open the window because that's the best way you can get some daylight into your room. And uh, if you're going to the bathroom, then if you want to get really 
full blast of good light than if you have blue LEDs in your bathroom and you crank it up all the way. If you, you should have a dimmer because you don't want that blue light at night time when you're waking right. up. To, so um, that's another way to um, get really good light. Hmm. And you know, I have I always also I have some interest in architecture, so I go to different interesting buildings. And one of the case study homes, so you know, the case study homes CSH, usually they are called CSH 2021, 20, 22. So there are case study homes in Southern California. One is there are actually quite a few in LA. What are these kind of these are like architecturally? These are these are the homes that were built after the World War II hmm. and they were designed to be low cost and uh, kind of have a lot of light coming through the house by glass wall or glass door. And the idea was to invite to, um, people returning from war to come to California and settle down here because, hey, this is low-cost housing and we yeah. know that you guys fought in all these terrible places and you most likely uh, like to be in the nature because and here we are kind of building all these houses with a lot of glass. So there are famous case study homes in in, Cal in California, in LA, there are quite a few case study homes that are also uh, popular in the Hollywood. Um, there are one or two examples I'll show you afterwards. Yeah, interesting. So the bottom line is there's one case study home where the bathroom has a uh, kind of a glass wall, but it's not transparent glass, it's kind of foggy glass. So that's, I think, the best example I have seen where these architects in 50s and 60s, they wanted to make sure that when somebody is taking bath, they should also get daylight. Wow. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think if you're building your next dream home, maybe you can think of a light tunnel coming into the house. Yeah. Or maybe to your bathroom. Of course, you don't want on the side, but if you have a uh, skylight built into your bathroom. That's smart. That'll be really cool. I don't spend a ton of time in the bathroom in the because um, I'm not like a day sh shower I yeah, shower at yeah. night but that it's really comforting to know that this light can permeate glass yeah blue light can permeate glass um so it's just it's opening the windows would you say also it's smart to put the lights on in the house yeah in the in the, yeah, yeah, in the yeah. daytime in the and morning it, yeah so that's why um and if you want to go for a walk how much time? Like, is it? 15 to 20 minutes is enough. 15 to uh, 20 br minutes. That bright light. Becomes... Sometimes, I mean, I feel like it's just like 30 seconds of like opening, you know, it wakes me up. Yeah, yeah it wakes you up. Yeah. And um, the process begins. Yeah. And people have also shown that 30 seconds of um, pulses. So 30 seconds, you open the window or curtain and then, you know, you went to the bathroom and you cranked up the light and that's another one or two minutes or five minutes and then you're coming back to the say, kitchen and if your kitchen has a big window yeah. again you're opening the window so all these things actually add up great to know yeah but if you if you have for example something outside you want to go check your um, garden uh, what are the plant or bird feeder or if you want to take the dog for a walk or you want to scoop out all the cat poop and <laughs> throw it outside. <laughs> all of that. That's uh, <laughs> that's my life. True story. Um, I, I, my morning routine involves I, I will often walk to a close by coffee shop. Yeah. Specifically because I'm f I'm familiar with your research yeah. and it, you know, I know how important it is. And I also get my steps in and I support the local economy yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So great. Yeah. So the next time when you're walking, just thank the. Uh, barista and also the <laughs> baker because they yes. started their day Those shift when workers. you are still sleeping. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> Extra tips for them. I wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. very grateful, very grateful. Yeah. yeah. So so that's why this, these two steps, for example, um, you know, we have gone through two and then let's talk to the, uh, about the next one. So yeah. that's the, um, yeah, try to eat your breakfast at a consistent time um, because just like light, resets a master clock, which is in the hypothalamus, we call the call it the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Mm. Um, so light is a very strong entrainer of the master clock. And um, I talk actually more extensively about this resetting process in the first book, The Circadian Code. People should definitely pick that yeah. up. It's wonderful. And then uh, food is the entraining cue for the rest of the body. Food is telling, yes, 
um, you were expecting for, the brain was expecting for, and I'm here. And so light entrains the brain, food entrains the body. body. And actually food entrains the body and also big chunk of the brain also. Because, mm. you know, the hunger satiety center, for example, it responds to food. The fluid balance center, it also responds to food. So many brain centers actually respond to food. Um, um, so that's why m maintaining a consistent breakfast time or your first meal. People say, oh, I skip breakfast, right? No, nobody skips actually breakfast because breakfast literally means breaking your fast. <laughs> You're right. So your first meal of the day. So try to be consistent with that. With that. And then when people say breakfast skipping is bad for you, what actually happens is those who skip in this literature, the scientific literature, clinical literature, they're essentially asking people, do you skip breakfast? And someone will say, yeah, I skip. I don't skip. Uh, sometimes I skip. So essentially what they're doing is sometimes they're eating breakfast, sometimes they're not eating breakfast, which is almost like giving their body the signal that today they're in LA, tomorrow they're in New York, and mm. day after tomorrow they're in Paris and they're coming back. So the metabolism is always in constant jet lag. And that might be contributing to all the adverse effect of what we say, breakfast skipping. Uh, Interesting. And that's not carefully monitored, means in many of the scientific literature, they will not say whether this person, what was defined as breakfast, because most people will think that eating something solid is breakfast. And most people don't consider that even coffee with cream and sugar is the same kind of signal for our metabolism, because you know when you're drinking that coffee, it's not just sitting in your stomach and turning on some light in your brain, it is absorbed. Yeah, the liver is processing it, and then sending that caffeine to brain, and brain, the brain is binding to its receptor and doing all that stuff. And if you have cream and sugar again, they all have to be digested. The whole villas wakes up, all these genes that turn on, and then they're like, "Okay, we got to process this." So you're breaking your you're breaking your fast. You're well, you're you're eating breakfast with that coffee, essentially. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that is breaking your fast to some extent. Wow. So um, that's why we have to take all this breakfast skipping literature with a boulder of salt mm. and ask carefully, like, what was the method? What was asked? What was defined as food? What are these people are skipping breakfast every single day? So, for example, if you say that the food that you eat within two hours of waking up is breakfast, and some people will say, well, I eat at 10 o'clock four hours after waking up. And the researcher might think that that's skipping breakfast. But in my opinion, that's not. It's just you are delaying your first meal and you're consistent. So, yeah. So that's something that we have to keep in mind. Um, so be consistent. Be consistent. And, and ideally one to two hours after waking up. At least wait for one to two hours. At least one to two hours. Yeah. But some people can wait for three hours or four hours. We haven't seen much. This is a field where we don't know whether somebody or the same person who, for example, the ideal experiment would be, you take a bunch of people who will uh, wake up, wait for six hours, say. Yeah. And they're waking up at, uh, say, 6 a.m., maybe give them a little bit of black coffee or no calories, and then they'll eat at noon, so that'll be their breaking the fast, and then they'll eat for eight hours, 8 p.m. And suppose that they're going to bed at 11 because we don't want that bedtime to interfere with all that stuff. And then they do that for eight weeks or 10 weeks. And then you ask the same people to, okay, so you wake up at 6 a.m., you're doing the same routine. Now eat your breakfast at 6.30. And then eat for 10, <laughs> eight hours and then mm. see what happens. So that experiment has not been done. Mm. But at least what we know from melatonin and cortisol and all that stuff, it's safe to say that you should delay your first meal by at least one to two hours after waking up. But it doesn't seem like there would be, if we're diurnal creatures meant to eat during the day, why would there be a benefit to delaying it six hours? Yeah, so uh, we don't know that mm. um, because, I'll get to that, because uh, what is interesting is um, if you take people who have and isolate them inside a house, they have no timing clue what time it is outside. Kind of mess them up a little bit so that they have no, it's like 
take a person, put a blindfold, spin them, and then they don't have any idea which direction they're starting. So yeah, similarly, you, you just send them to Vegas. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. So these, these volunteers are actually put into a room where there is no window and no sense of time because you cannot take your phone and there is no TV or live TV or anything. So then you ask them, are you feeling hungry? Are you feeling hungry in every hour? And they're actually eating small meals or something. What researchers found was they're more hungry towards the second half of the day. Interesting. So it was usually late afternoon, evening. Hmm. And the question is, why? Why are we designed that way? Because, you know, our ancestors, they didn't have the refrigerator to <laughs> go walk up in the morning and right. get something. So they had to go through a long fasting period throughout the night. And most likely that night was really cold. So they also had to burn some extra fat to go through that cold. Um, and I do many weird things. And one <laughs> weird thing I did was I was carrying a temperature logger with me, not touching my skin, but in my jacket pocket. And uh, I did that for a year. Uh, so always the temperature logger was next to me. Hmm. When I was sleeping, I, I just I would just leave it next to it. And these loggers are usually sent in um, uh, containers to make sure that if you're sending some perishable or something, electronics that is more sensitive to hot and cold, you want to make sure that during shipment this is okay. So I said, okay, I'll hold it. <laughs> and I went around the world uh, during my you know, my usual travel and all that stuff. What I found was really interesting. When I was in the US, and you know, I live in San Diego, there is not much temperature fluctuation between winter and mid, there is some. Uh, but at that time, my house had air conditioning. Now I stopped the air conditioning. <laughs> but what I found was when I was in the US, I was exposed to a very narrow temperature fluctuation, say between 19 to 22 degrees centigrade. You can do the conversion. Mm. Um, uh, the only time my temperature actually fluctuated a lot was when I was walking from parking lot to my office, or my office to parking lot. Right. Because then I also realized that I'm such an indoor person. <laughs> and I, 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 those days, I never went for walking or running in the yeah, and the wild it. or outside, so that was kind of interesting. But then... Pretty representative, though. Like 93% yeah. of our time is spent indoors these yeah, days. Yeah. Um, but when I was in Europe, Europe doesn't have uh, air conditioning in many of their hotels and um, their offices and even labs are not as uh, controlled as in the U.S. Um, and... In Europe, I would experience a five to 10 degree centigrade fluctuation between day and night. And it was a nice circadian <laughs> kind of fluctuation. Wow. Okay. And then when I was in Africa, that was like 10 to 15 degree centigrade fluctuation, very strong fluctuation. And same thing in India. Um, so, so that's the interesting thing that we are actually exposed. We are kind of in a constant temperature environment and our ancestors used to experience that very cold night, long period of fasting. And even if they woke up in the morning, it was not that the fruits and vegetables were just waiting there <laughs> right outside the door. Yeah. They had to go and hunt or pick up some berries and all that stuff. So that's why maybe we were programmed to actually feel hungry in the evening. And, uh, you know, th there is all these comments and people always say, yes, they said that you should eat like a king, breakfast like a king and all that stuff. But then if we look at our physiology, it's kind of interesting that, and it's also a dichotomy that we still don't understand. And I must ask people who do more endocrinology and nutrition because our pancreas is more sensitive towards the first half of the day. And why we are feeling more hungry towards the second half of the day. And the answer may be, we are more likely to get up and eat something that's readily available. And what is readily available? Berries, nuts, fruits, and vegetables. And what is common among all of them? They have, on an average, somewhere between 80 to 90% of calories from carbohydrate. And in old days, fire was very expensive. It was not easy to light a fire throughout the day. 
So the only time you'd light a fire, if you're smart, and our ancestors were very smart, <laughs> that they would light the fire in the end of the day, in the evening, because the smoke from the fire would repel all the mosquitoes and insects. And then once the fire is up, then whatever they have um, captured, means if, if, if they had some meat, they would bake that. Or, you know, if you go to Africa and many other countries, there are tubers or lentils. Those have to be cooked. Mm. You cannot consume them. So those have to be cooked in fire. And what is common among all of them is they have high protein and complex carb and sometimes even high fat. In the evening. In the evening. So that might make sense why we are programmed to feel more hungry in the evening, to have a big meal, which is not rich in carbohydrate, but rich in protein and fat, so that we could go through that long cold night, which actually doesn't happen in the US, but at least. Wow. <laughs> and then the next day, um, the cycle continues. That's so interesting. I wonder if it also has to do with the fact that like typically, you know, the di diurnal cortisol pattern, it's like we're liberating our like stored fuels during the day primarily. Yeah. You know, like all the stored sugar, all the stored fat, like our bodies are primed to use what we have stored during the day. Yeah, and also at night, like uh, so like why would we be hungry during the day? But also, isn't the isn't the GI tract like revved up during the day? Isn't yeah, peristalsis yeah, yeah. really you know? Yeah, peristalsis and everything is really revved up, and it actually slows down maybe two a couple of hours before our bedtime. Hmm. Um, it slows down. Um, but anyway, so the idea is yes, we should uh, start eating and then eat everything within eight to ten hours, um, maximum twelve. Hmm. The reason is, even if we finish our food, although our mouth finishes the eating, chewing part, uh, the food remains in our stomach for four to five hours because that's the time it takes for the digestive enzymes and the acid to kind of break down the food into tiny particles because our intestine just cannot extract food bits of, from bits of chicken and So it's <laughs> more helpful maybe that it's slow later on. <laughs> yeah. Slower later on. So then, uh, so that's why, although we finish eating, it's, our stomach is still working for the next four to five hours at least. Wow, super um, interesting. So that's why our, um, if we eat, if we finish our meal um, three to two to three hours before bedtime, that's good. So now we went through three only. Okay, so let's... <laughs> yeah, let's hit four. <laughs> four. Just move the mic a little bit closer okay. to you, yeah. Okay, so um, number four is um, uh, daylight, but at, at least uh, we have covered part of it. Um, so then the question is how much light we should get? Because as you said, we spend 93% of our time indoor. And a lot of people actually don't have access to window. And it's very clear that, you know, you go to a typical office, uh, place, workplace, um, the people who are high up in the pecking order, they get the window <laughs> office. <laughs> right. But there are very few managers who get the window office and then everybody else is in the middle of the floor. Right. And then if you think about um, women who had a baby, so there are 1.6 million people, the baby is born, um, when they're going through uh, postpartum period, um, they're also sleep deprived. And if they are taking days off to spend bond with the baby, they're also most likely to be indoor. And they may not get that much light. Then there are people who cannot move, the elderly or who have different conditions, they cannot go outdoor, they're also indoor, they get stuck. So that's why it's very important to think about that, that light has another property. Light actually increases our alertness and mood. And it's very clear that um, people who live in the Nordic countries, they figured this out, that <laughs> there is winter blues, so they are very, mindful of light, if they feel depressed, they know that they have to expose to light. And even in, I have seen in next to Geneva airport, there are even light, lighting salons where you go and pay to wow. <laughs> get exposed to super bright light. So the bottom line is then how much light you should get. The rule of thumb, most scientists agree if you don't have access to fancy calculators to figure out is, and uh, 
try to be outdoor for 30 to 60 minutes because even on a cloudy day in London, you still get 5,000 to 10,000 lux of light. In a sunny day in LA, you'll get 100 to 200,000 lux of light. So on a sunny day, it's okay to wear your sunglasses because um, the, your eyes are still getting uh, more, than enough. more than what is uh, needed. But if you're driving, Actually, inside a car, the light level is five to 10,000 lux. Inside the car, it's almost like a cloudy day. Mm. And if you're wearing sunglasses, then you're still reducing. And this is, again, being a nerd, I wore a light sensor on my wrist for several years, actually. And then, <laughs> <laughs> I love that. What I found was I, get, I used to get exposed to less than one hour of bright light when I, I was in San Diego. Mm. I work at Salk Institute. It's an awesome institute. The, um, you know, Jonas Salk, who is the inventor of polio vaccine, he realized that your the brain has to be nurtured inside a healthy building. And even in those days, 60s, 50s, and 60s, he figured out that light has a huge impact on brain. Mm. So the institute is built in a way that uh, the, there are glass walls, and literally, means in 50s and 60s, nobody was making glass walls, but the walls are glass. And he also has in the <laughs> rule book for the for the institute that we cannot just go and block that glass wall. My, you know, my I have blinds in my office. <laughs> I put on the blinds, and I don't get light. And uh, uh, so, still, I'm saying that. Living in San Diego and working at Salk Institute, which is built to bring light into the workplace, I didn't realize that I was blocking all the light. So wow. since then, I have stopped wearing sunglasses because in most cases. Means mm. when I'm driving, if there is sunrise or sunset kind of time when I would get blinded, then I wear them. Okay, so we have to be outside for 30 to 60 minutes. And if somebody is depressed, then it's even more helpful. Another thing that um, uh, Dr. Honma um, figured out in that experiment was when people are exposed to bright light during daytime, for some reason that I don't understand yet, the nighttime melatonin levels go up. Hmm. So that means we know that sometimes when you go to the beach or when you're hiking all day, you come back and you feel more sleepy that night. Yes, maybe physical exertion, but... You know, when I when we go to the beach, we're just lying there. Or, <laughs> you know, there is no exertion. This may explain why some people who stay outdoor they actually have better sleep at night. Mm. So even during daytime, if you have a patio or place where you can be outdoor, be there. I wonder if people sleep better when they're on vacation for this reason. Yeah, maybe that is another reason. So this is another reason why. You should be exposed to more light. It improves your alertness, and then it increases um, your melatonin level at night. Helps you sleep better. You know, if we think about it, eighty-five percent of people, at some point in their life, experience depression. And at any given time, five to ten percent of people in the U.S. are going through depression. So light is kind of an antidepressant. It's plentiful and free outside. You don't have to go take an appointment with a shrink. Anyways, that appointment will keep you waiting for four to six weeks. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> maybe when you're waiting for that, yeah. make sure that you go just step outside for 30 to 60 minutes. And that can improve mood. Wow. So it's like being on time with the sun. Yeah. <laughs> The sun is there. It's telling, okay, come. I'm giving you this drug, antidepressant. Just come outside. It's a, it's like a form of medicine. Yeah. And also melatonin, which you you haven't yet touched on, yeah. is uh it's not just involved in sleep, right? I mean it's an it's a it's an antioxidant. It's involved in like cancer protection. Yeah, it's we're got still all these other roles, all, the, all these other side hustles. Yeah, we're still uh, trying to figure out um, and the melatonin field because, you know, with the discovery of melatonin receptor and all these polymorphisms and everything, it actually makes it more exciting to go back to that field and 
explore it more. So crazy. Okay. So now we have gone through four, right? Yes. Okay. Up to, up to five. Number five is we should not forget exercise. And in fact, there is circadian clock even in our exercise tissue. The musculoskeletal system has clocks. And uh, one of the big thing is a muscle clock is really interesting. It is programmed, our muscles are programmed to have best muscle tone late afternoon. And also, when we go do exercise, we typically warm up. So that means what? We're increasing the body temperature by some activity. And our body temperature reaches around its peak in the evening, late afternoon. Hmm. So in that way, we have much better muscle tone. We're more flexible because of the temperature. And so that's why it's much better to go do exercise in the evening. So this is for people, athletes, who want to maximize their athletic performance. In fact, many of the sports records are broken in late afternoon, evening. Um, and then our cognitive performance is also better in the light, it's, it's better than late at night. So people have seen that even in, um, um, in sports, which requires, means when you're an endurance athlete, you just have to run. You just have to make sure that you're running on the track. Mm. That's it. Yeah. But if you're playing, say, in the NBA or NFL or baseball, whatever it is, it needs both cognitive performance and physical performance and motor coordination and all that stuff. All that stuff come together late in the afternoon. Mm. And um, this is, again, we don't know a lot about it. There are just phenomenological observations. I'm really grateful to Clara Wu and Joe Shai. Uh, they're big philanthropists. They own um, one NBA team, I wouldn't say. But what is really important is they wanted to figure this out more and figure out how to improve peak performance and um, of, for everyone. If you think about the reason why I'm bringing up musculoskeletal system and muscle is we also know that anyone who does exercise, one thing that's inevitably happen at one point or other is some injury. Mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so either you'll sprain something or it'll break something or your tendon or ligament will get weaker. Uh, even people will say that, yes, they ran all years and then by 60s or 70s, they are not running anymore because of injury. And if you think about what is the cost of societal and economic cost of injury, and I was completely unaware about this, and it came up only when Clara kind of made us to think about it and we realized that the total cost of musculoskeletal system injury and recovery rehab in the U.S. is close to a trillion dollars. Wow. That's almost two to three times more than what we spend on cancer, which is... Definitely. I'm not saying that we should not spend that. But this is something that's overlooked. Mm. And uh, we know that just like athletes um, are always worried about injury, everybody else is. It's not that we're spending a trillion dollars to cure, to make athletes um, perform better. It's everybody. Yeah. Almost everybody at the age of 60 or 70 has some injury. So many people are going through back injury and then so many hip replacement, knee replacement, all of that injury. And um, Clara and Joe actually funded this Ushai Human Performance Alliance across six different institutes to study uh, the science of performance. When we say performance, it's, we also know that muscle affects our brain. So it's physical, intellectual, and emotional performance at every stage of our life. Um, so I'm really grateful for Clara and Joe to have this, which runs across uh, Stanford's, uh, Salk, UCSD, Harvard, University of Oregon, and Kansas. And through this, we are now bringing together uh, scientists working in many different fields, bioengineering, female athletes, and then basic science like ours, modelers, uh, like mathematical modelers, and um, machine learning, AI, and region rehab. But during this process, I also learned that our musculoskeletal system, even our bones have a circadian clock, 
and that tunes how much a bone is degraded every day and how much of new bone is formed. Same thing goes on in the ligament, tendon, uh, the extracellular matrix, the glue that keeps things together, it actually has to recycle. And the muscle um, function, so that's how um, we can go back to the circadian rhythm that if we improve circadian function, not only we improve our performance, we can also optimize how our bone is remodeled, how our joints are remodeled so that we can stay healthy for a long mm. time. So this is for, you might think that, okay, so people who are physically fit and trying to beat their own athletic performance, they should do exercise in the late afternoon. But again, what is another exciting thing that came out of Karolinska Institute in Sweden um, by my uh, new close friend, Julian Girath, who is a leader in exercise physiology and also in chronic disease, um, her team, um, led by Anna Crook, they did a very simple experiment. They took patients with type 2 diabetes. We always tell people with type 2 diabetes, move more, eat less. And then the question is, if they move more in the morning, will they get best benefit? Or if they move more in the afternoon, <laughs> will they get best benefit? Mm. So these people were hooked up to a continuous glucose monitor. And they were given the same high intensity interval training to do in the morning for a few days. And then they kind of, there was a wash out period. And then they did the same, ex same exercise in the late afternoon, evening, or vice versa. What was exciting and surprising and shocking to know was the same people, when they did exercise in late afternoon, their blood glucose level improved significantly. That means that 24 hours, for 24 hours, their blood glucose level was lower than when they were not doing exercise at all. When they did exercise in the morning, they didn't get any benefit. Not only that, for some people, the blood sugar level actually increased. Whoa. So, it, so exercise at the wrong time can be, I'm not saying that always, can be uh, not effective, not give you the right answer. So that's why even for exercise, you have to be on time mm. with your circadian clock. Wow. And what, what about, I mean, so what about for like, you know, fit, fitness people listening to this might be saying to themselves, well, if you're pressed for time, any time is, it's, yeah. be it's better to exercise than, than to not exercise. Yeah, would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, I totally agree with that. So that's why I say that if you're waking up in the morning and uh, if you want to go for a run in the morning, you're getting light, you're getting exercise. And, you know, sometimes I use that to beat my jet lag because <laughs> yeah. it also increases your cortisol level and mm. it kind of you stay awake at least for the first half of the meeting. Exercise so. in the morning can help. Yeah, uh, so that's what I, I do. Like I when I'm um, and I do for many other reasons. Like if I'm in in a nice city, of course, late in the evening or afternoon, I'm meeting with my host or friends, and I'm kind of stuck in a, a restaurant sometimes. So I don't get to see the city. Hmm. So the best time to see the city is actually yeah. in the morning. So I I go run, stop in many places, take selfie, take pictures, and you know the whole city is to myself because there are very few people. <laughs> and, I love that. So that's another reason too. That's so of. funny. <laughs> Do you have an Instagram? You post them on like uh... no, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So another thing that we understand is um, muscle uses a lot of glucose without any help from insulin. So that's called insulin independent. Um, use by muscle, use of glucose by muscle. And towards the late afternoon, our insulin production is actually reduced, means the pancreas is kind of tired, you can say, and there is a clock-dependent reduction in insulin release. It's not only melatonin. Melatonin come a few hours later. but So maybe this is the reason why um, we are designed to be more active in the late afternoon. Hmm. And then... Um, I have another, <laughs> so this, this, this is the reason why I say whatever I'm saying here comes from many different people's research. One is Horacio D. Iglesia, de la Iglesia, who is at uh, University of Washington, UW. He went and put activity trackers on people who have no access to electricity. 
So these are in uh, Tobas in Argentina. And I looked at the activity record to see, hey, let's see how are Tobas active because we are comparing activity levels of Tobas with um, Seattle High School student for a project. Um, what was interesting was the Tobas are active throughout the day, but towards the late afternoon, right before evening, there was a big spike in activity. Hmm. I'm like, why does that happen? And I said, well, it makes sense because when you don't have electricity, it's really scary to be outside. Um, even in, in some parts of LA, it's scary to be outside. <laughs> <laughs> even with light. <laughs> with light. Yeah. Of course, you're driving, but imagine if you yes. don't have a car, right, right. then you would drive, ride your bicycle or run away, right? Yeah. <laughs> means once I was, means it didn't hit me that strongly until I was in, um, in, a, in outside Nairobi in Masai Mara. You know, you uh, go and stay in these camps and uh, they always tell you that, yes, don't go outside at night and we'll come. And if you have to go, then call. Some guard will come with, um, they'll take you out, take you to go from one uh, tent to another or something like that. But I remember once I kind of got lost just before sunset um, because there are these buses and I kind of lost track of my direction. And I realized for the first time, I felt that primal fear mm. that there is maybe a lion somewhere <laughs> or a cheetah or something or, uh, you know, hyenas. And I have to find my way as quickly as possible before it becomes dark. Mm. And I remember trying to run or trying to find my way much faster. Means I'm more active. I'm like, my stress level is going up and I just wanted to come back. And of course, I made it. But that's what used to happen for our ancestors for 200,000 years <laughs> minus 150, whatever yeah. it is. <laughs> so. Night hasn't been utterly terrifying for only the past 150 years. Yeah. You go back 150 <laughs> years ago, <laughs> past sundown, the world is terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's hilarious to think about. But even today, like you end up yeah. in a, you know, anywhere where there's like, you know, no light, you end up like camping or in, in, a, in a forest environment. Just imagine yeah. like your car breaks down anywhere on the side of the road at night yeah. and you are without your modern conveniences for a yeah. moment. Yeah. It's terrifying. Now, I guess we also have to keep in mind, Vince, you and I both are males and being male has some privilege in the sense that we are less like to be, likely to be, we are less fearful of night than women. I'm pretty afraid of night. No, <laughs> I'm not. Well, yeah. But yes, no, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I, see what you're I saying. mean, they, they have to feel more safe. Yes. And, you know, um, for example, in UCSD or Salk, I see, um, there are many um, students, female students, women, uh, female students, or postdocs or trainees. Uh, there was a time when um, they had to call the security saying that, hey, can somebody walk with them to their car? Hmm. So uh, in that way, we also have to think that, yes, evening time as we laid out this way, it was very fearful and people had to run back. And maybe that's why we're designed to be more active late in the afternoon, just before sunset, to run back. And then during that process, we are also kind of using up all the glucose that we got from the ripe berries or whatever we ate or whatever we gathered. And not only that, the effect of that physical activity on insulin, sorry, on insulin mediated glucose absorption or insulin independent can stay for a few minutes even after the exercise, hmm. even uh, for an hour or so, maybe for insulin mediated response. So that's why we are now finishing the fifth one <laughs> be on time about exercise, late afternoon, early evening is much better than morning, and particularly. Those who have uh, trouble with blood sugar regulation, it may be better to have that evening walk or evening run if you can do, or get on the treadmill or just go around the block um, mm. or take your cat, no, sorry, dog for a walk. <laughs> <laughs> or cat. Yeah. <laughs> I've tried. <laughs> um, she's not into it. Okay, so we're up to so number six, six. The last one. Yeah. Okay, so now the evening rolls in. And uh, the role of circadian clock is to 
um, again, to cool down our body and uh, increase melatonin level. And one thing that happens after we eat is thermic effect of food, right? So when we eat, our core body temperature goes up. And you discussed this with uh, some podcast guest uh, in the past, I guess. Um, yeah, we talk about like the thermic, the thermic effect, effect of eating. Of yeah. yeah, yeah. So that means um, when we eat, particularly a big meal, our core body temperature will go up because there are a lot of blood circulation to the gut to digest, absorb nutrition. Particularly a high protein meal. Yeah. And, you know, as you discussed, yeah. our ancestors also were baking and cooking and all that stuff. And whether they were cooking lentils or, <laughs> yeah. or grilling some meat, it was all high protein towards the end of the day. Hmm. Uh, so now the, the, there is this contradiction that for sleep, we need our core body temperature to cool down. And we have this postprandial thermic effect of food. So then how do we manage this too? So that means that we should finish eating two to three hours before bedtime. So we started with when we should start eating. And now we're talking about giving another two to three hours before bedtime. And you can think of, okay, so this is the time when we have to finish digesting for the digestive enzymes, the digestive hormones are finishing their job of the day. And the night hormones are beginning to start their work. The melatonin levels should begin to rise. So this is, again, another time of the day when there is changing of the guards. Mm. <laughs> so um, then the second thing is uh, for that melatonin levels to rise, we have to reduce, dim down our light and get into this candlelit dinner, uh, sorry, <laughs> evening. <laughs> so romantic. <laughs> yeah. So this is the time when you should also dim down your light and uh, if you can't or if you want to pay money, maybe wear those um, glasses, um, the funky blue filtering glasses. Do you, do, do you wear those? No, not yet. No, okay. Because <laughs> no, I dim down my light yeah. uh, as much as possible. So and, do I. Yeah. I keep my lights. Uh, I'm very cognizant of like yeah. my, the, the lighting in my house at night. Yeah. Um, and I don't all, you know, I watch TV sometimes before bed. Yeah. Um, but so be mindful of the light that you allow to enter your eyes. In the evening. Yeah. So, you know, all of these, again, your day starts from going to bed, what time you go to bed. So now to make this, um, you can see that now there are only six, five or six key things. And if you combine, say, walking in the afternoon with daylight exposure, then you're down to five stuff. So... Um, that's what we're also seeing in many of our studies, that mm. if we tell people these five things, even in our time eating studies, because we know that if they don't sleep well at night, they're not going to control their urge to eat. Right. So that's why we ask them, hey, try to be more mindful about when you sleep. Mm. And then we also train them that, yeah, wait for one or two hours after waking up, because if you have to compress your eating time to eight to 10 hours, it's good to trim something in the front end and trim something in the back end so that it's not giving you too much stress. Yeah. Um, so uh, they find it easy. Uh, so we have now taken all these five, four or five major things and we just started a new uh, simple app called On Time Health. And this is now, we are hoping that um, this is entirely based on all these studies on sleep, circadian rhythm, what time should be the peak time for exercise. And uh, hopefully uh, this will make it simple for people to kind of get aware about their own circadian rhythm and follow a simple habit. We don't expect that every day they can do all five things. And you and I know that sometimes we do exercise and sometimes we know that, okay, so this day looks feels really bad. Let's go out. and Yeah. Uh, so even if... People do two or three things out of this. At least they know the toolbox. Yeah, they, they have the tools. Up. Yeah, every day doesn't have to be perfect. No. So wait, you said there's a, you're develop, you have an app. Yeah. So this is uh, on time health. On time health. Yeah. It's um, available. So it's uh, now available from this month. We kind wow. of uh, started. We beta tested for a long time, and then we say, okay, so let's see. Because we have the My Circadian Clock app that is only that we use for research purpose. There are now twelve different research going on. And the thing is, for every research, we um, customize the app. 
Hmm. So that means um, for a cancer, we actually have a study on cancer to see whether time rotating, optimum circadian timing will help for prehab because many people who go through cancer therapy, it's not easy. So sometimes they have to even lose weight or they have to get mentally prepared. They have to get into better sleep habit because... One big thing that people have seen again and again is people who sleep regularly and maintain a good sleep, they have a much better chance, much better prognosis in breast cancer than those who don't sleep regularly. So mm. similarly now with time restricting, at least the mouse studies are showing that time restricted eating can slow down the growth of tumor, prevent tumor implantation even. And human studies, epidemiology studies, have shown that women who go through at least 13 hours of fasting every day, they have low risk for breast cancer. And particularly those who had breast cancer once, we know that those who had breast cancer, there is a high chance of recurrence to get the cancer again. So those who go through 13 hours of fast or more, and they have less chance of that relapse happening. So, wow. Less so since chance. we do all this, uh, we take the My Circadian Clock app and then we tweak it slightly for different patient groups because we're giving them different sets of instructions, different sets of um, blogs and reading material. So since it's always in a flux, we thought, okay, so we need another one that people can just take and use it simply. So that's why I came up with this. Amazing. And the idea is very simple, to be on time with your circadian clock. So that, And at the same time, when you do all these habits at the right time, you're also training your circadian clock. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here, and I'll see you there. So the message that got out to the world was, well, women shouldn't fast. And it was like this whole part of the conversation of fasting was left out. And at the root of that is we are hormonally different.